Greetings everyone. Today I want to talk about how you as a player can make a compelling character that's going to make the game better for both yourself, your GM, and everyone else. Uh, so as an example, I'm going to be going over how I created my character Cade Kale for a Within the Ring of Fire saga um, called Through Reason or Through Force. Uh, it was kind of complicated coming up for him. There's a lot of different uh, factors that came into it, but I think the most important thing that I want you guys to take away from this is that if you want to make a character that matters to you, it matters to the game, and matters to other people, uh, you have to start off by giving them something at stake from the beginning. Um, it's not just the GM's job to come up with uh, a storyline that engages you and pulls your character into it uh, and, and gives you a goal to pursue. That is your job. Um, a lot of the weight of that falls on you. <clears throat> and uh, when you create a character that has kind of a built-in goal already, it gives you something to, to work toward from the moment that you start playing the game. Um, now, this is going to contain spoilers on this character. I'm not sure if this game is going to continue at some point. It might, so... If you are in that game uh, or you are watching through reason or force we haven't played in months but if we do this is gonna have it's gonna spoil everything about my character's background so if you don't want to hear about that uh, don't watch the video um, but if you do want to hear about it and you do want my advice then then keep watching um, so anyway basically when George approached us with the idea for this game it was going to be kind of a sandbox and the premise was that there was going to be a new frontier settlement that uh, we were going to try and either build up into an empire or expand in some way, make it something great, or fail and, and watch it crumble along that path. <clears throat> so that uh, really influenced the type of character I wanted to play from the beginning. Uh, I didn't want to make this game about military conquest from, uh, from my point of view. Uh, I really wanted someone who was going to be heavily invested in trying to see the civilization prosper and to grow. Um, and that actually played to kind of my biases in uh, within the Ring of Fire in that the humans and the Kalfar are both my favorite species. Uh, and both of them tend to be uh, involved from the get-go in either building cities or creating big trade empires uh, and and things of that nature. Um, so I got to choose from my two favorite species to start. Um, and when it really came down to it, I wanted to play a human um, because I do like the kind of the, the built-in desire to build that they have. When the god Pelgin created them in his image, uh, he created them as the most adaptable species uh, that had ever walked the face of Kavega Thale, and he gave them at their core a desire to, uh, to aspire to greatness, whether that is through conquest uh, or through building things um, and, and, and taking resources and transforming them into something new. Uh, so I wanted to play a human, but I also wanted to do something different. Most of the time, I like to play a character that is either at the beginning of their, the prime of their life or is well into the prime of their life, meaning someone in their you know early to mid twenties all the way through maybe their uh, their mid forties to early fifties. Uh, but I wanted to do something different. Um, something I've never done is to play an old character. Uh, so, and I had been watching a lot of Game of Thrones, and I my one of my favorite characters on the show. I don't read the books, so please don't even go there, uh, is Tywin Lannister. Um, and that he is this this old man, this seemingly frail old man who still gets the best of everyone, who just has this just razor-sharp mind and is willing to do anything to see his goals completed. Um, so, of course, I wanted my character to look like Charles Dance, who plays Tywin Lannister. Uh, however, I didn't want to take on the, uh, the ruthless, murderous nature of... Uh, Tywin Lannister. Um, I wanted someone who was going to be uh, more about beating people on on even ground, just uh, overcoming them by the nature of being uh, being better and smarter than them, um, without having to resort to physical violence. Um, and 
so I began coming up with the character and uh, human beings have a very short lifespan in comparison to the other species in Kavega Thale. Uh, but there was an advantage that had really caught my eye previously, and I just wrote it down on my character sheet because I knew it would double his lifespan. I didn't know about the other benefits of it at the time, um, but I chose the advantage uh, second generation for human beings. And so what that means is that humans are such a new species that some of the first humans to have ever walked the face of the earth are still alive. Uh, and these these first humans have an extended lifespan. and and that extended uh, extended lifespan also um, is is bequeathed to the first generation of their children. After that, uh, they they tend to live you know a regular human lifespan. So I took this because my initial concept was that I wanted this character uh, to be the last human survivor of uh, the human tribes on the southern continent of Kavega Thale because I thought that was that was just that was cool. That was an interesting idea, and it would give me an enemy. It would give me. An enemy right off the bat, and that would be the lizard men, the Sarush. In Kavega Thale, uh, the the story of the human of the humans on the the southern continent is very bleak. They, uh, after just a few cycles, were devoured by the Sarush. The Sarush thought that they were, you know, this this disgusting abomination, and that they tasted very good, and so they committed genocide and wiped them all out. Uh, and so basically, I wanted someone um, who, as like you know, a toddler was swept up by uh, someone seeing this genocide uh, and taken away um, so uh, and, and brought into the northern continent to, to bail. Uh, and he would have this, this deep resentment and hatred for the Sarush uh, simply because he had experienced and he knew his family ended up in their cook pots and were, and were ripped apart and devoured by them. Uh, but when I started looking because I wanted this to be a consistent character, I, I tend a lot of times to gloss over details. I, I tend to, when I read an RPG book, I'll read it front to back and be like, whoa, this is awesome. And then I'll forget minor details. Uh, so I didn't want to do that this time. I went back and looked at this, uh, the, the timeline of when that happened versus when uh, did the humans come to power in Bale. And the, the humans being devoured by the Suresh was very, very early uh, in their lifespan. And it would have made him like almost twice as old as I wanted him to be. Um, so I ditched that idea, and it's an idea that I have for that I can use for a different character at a different time in a different saga. But it didn't quite fit for me, uh, so I ditched that idea. But that was going to give me something at stake uh, right off of the beginning. That's going to give me kind of a skeleton in my closet, an ammunition to give to the game master, the flame teller, uh, flame tender. I almost said flame teller as in storyteller and flame tender together. Um, it was going to give me something at stake right from the beginning. Uh, and it didn't work out, and I'm glad it didn't because my character ended up being a hell of a lot cooler because of that. So I stuck with second generation, and I was looking through the kind of history and, and looking at Vale, and I decided that I wanted someone uh, who was very old, who had grown up right after the humans had taken over Vale. So he was like a child when the humans had their uprising. When they were basically forced, the the Pharaoh and Baal said, uh, "Humans, get your possessions and get out. You're not, you don't belong here anymore." The humans stood up to them and um, and and won and became the dominant power in Baal. Um, and so he grew up in this time of great transition and change, where there was all of this these opportunities that didn't exist for human beings uh, before that. Now. Uh, everything was open to them, and so, uh, and I really took this distilled image of of the humans in that they have this 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 need to grow, this need to uh, to 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 conquer their surroundings and to and to better them and and and, and all of this, and so I, I thought of him as the this idea of that he's going to be this very very successful businessman, and. I didn't, again, going back to the issue of I didn't want to play a character in their prime, I wanted to play someone who was on the ropes a little bit, um, I decided to have, to play this older character, to be in the twilight of his life when uh, he had been beaten down, basically, and had to try and, and for one last time to rise up and, and uh, exceed what he thought his own potential was. And so by doing that, I wrote into his background that he was essentially one of the wealthiest people in Kavega Thale by the time he was in, uh, he was middle-aged. Uh, and the reason being that 
uh, when he was very young, when he was in his late teens and early 20s, uh, or whatever the equivalent is in cycles, uh, he was uh, he entered the building trades and was just this just this master in the building trades and uh, very shortly you know by his mid 20s he had his own construction uh, company and was taking on large projects uh, expanding bail creating these creating towers and and uh, basically skyscrapers out of nothing and uh, over time getting uh, bigger and bigger and more famous projects and having his name be heard uh, far and wide throughout the human community and what this uh, kind of culminated in was uh, when he was really very uh, at the beginning of his his, uh, his his large successes, he was contracted to restore the Temple of Pelgin in the city of trade. And he did so. And by doing that, he ended up catching the eye of some of the more international business interests, the more important business interests, uh, and that being the trading, trading consortium in Jolf. Uh, the Kalfar. The Kalfar are seriously aggressive businessmen uh, and I wanted, to, since I did want someone who was influenced by the Kalfar because they are my second favorite species, I basically saw him as being a character who having this inbuilt desire to to create as a human was, was a big part of his life, but at the same time he was not a religious man and he grew up uh, in, in a very, in, in, in the Pelgin, uh, in the Pelganistic tradition, and he did things for Pelgin out of a sense of duty, um, not out of a sense of religiosity. So he took on several wives, and he had uh, many, many children, and they had many children and grandchildren. Um, and so he does have this long family tree, but he is estranged from them. He is he he never did this out of a sense of, of love, uh, falling in love with a woman, anything along those lines. And uh, for those of you not familiar with the game, uh, there are matriarchal societies, there are patriarchal societies in this game. Uh, human beings are a patriarchal polygamous society. Um, so he did this out of a sense of duty, and so he does have a family tree starting from him uh, that that spreads far and wide. Uh, but he was never there for them on any sort of an emotional level. He provides for them, he still provides for them, uh, but does not, he's, he's not even in contact with them anymore. But when he met the Kalfar, he found that he believed he had found his true people. These were the people who desired the same things that he did, although they were more underhanded and more violent than he was about it for the most part. Um, he moved uh, permanently to the city of Jolf, and that's where he kind of was his, his home base of operations. Uh, so he takes on bigger and bigger projects, becomes more and more successful, and takes on more and more financial responsibility for them uh, until a number of horrendous twists of fate ended up financially ruining him. Um, and essentially what happened in his past was that he was responsible for overseeing the construction of new cities, all these in, uh, the infrastructure, and uh, he bought into these uh, a lot, and he had done this many times, uh, putting his own money into these projects and, and getting big returns off of them. But he had several projects go completely belly up uh, within a couple of cycles of one another, and uh, he was looked at as basically having been cursed. He has this black mark of failure upon him, and the banking interests that he was involved with ended up uh, pinning the losses on him. And so out of his own personal fortune, he was he was forced to cover these losses. Uh, but because of his status, because of his long reputation, they couldn't just get rid of him um, without causing an enormous amount of problems within Jolf itself. So what they did was they buried him, basically. They made a new office for him in a dark corner uh, where he would never have responsibility or the ability to act uh, act seriously in, in, on his motives, on his his desire to, to build ever again. He was essentially create, uh, uh, made into a glorified clerk. Um, and the the projects that went belly up, there was a civil war that ended up, ended up destroying a city uh, by an even crueler twist of fate. Uh, a magi, a witch of great power, 
uh, somewhere in the region where uh, one of his his mining operations was, it wasn't even like his wasn't the epicenter or targeted. Uh, summoned the troll Mingzer. Mingzer is one of the seventy seven divinities, uh, a hungry and angry divinity that, in order to escape her prison in uh, at the end of the God's War, broke her essence into billions of locusts. And when this being answers a call uh, by the Magi, these locusts swarm to the area and eat and devour every bit of food. So the uh, the countryside was turned into a wasteland and his operations, everybody starved to death. Uh, and this was again pinned on him. Uh, so I've taken this character who is, who's already basically had all of the great things that you would want to have happen to your character in a game, they have happened and that has been turned and reversed on him. So he spends decades or the equivalent in cycles thereof um, growing older and more bitter in this this tomb that has been constructed for him, this mausoleum, this office, uh, where he has no responsibility and cannot have responsibility. He has but a pittance of, of his former wealth. Uh, he can still, which most of which is, is sent back to uh, supporting his family. Um, he lives comfortably, but comfort is is death to him. He needs challenge. He needs something to build something to do, and that is life for him. And he sits in his in his his little office and dreams of embarrassing those who uh, who who have falsely attributed all of this failure to him. He dreams of of bringing them down, of building himself up, and 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 rubbing it in their faces, rebuilding his fortune. And he is finally given the opportunity to do so. He is approached in this this office of his by shadowy figures who at first were not clear on who they were working for what the project was but they were trying to coax him into a deal coax him into building something for him in a new settlement a fresh start this this city of Argonaut uh, which is where the game takes place this is the settlement this was the premise of, of this game uh, he's approached by them to construct a temple for the god Metea. Metea being this divinity of, of banking and, and interest rates and uh, and and trying to soak your your you know your your debtor as much as you can. Um, and knowing that this man had this experience and knowing that he wasn't going to attract uh, you know if he did have some small business interest it wasn't going to attract much attention. They approached him uh, through the uh, in in the depths of the trading consortium. And uh, what they didn't count on, what they what they counted on was that he was going to be an old man who might be able to build a building for them and keep his mouth shut. What they didn't count for was that his mind is still sharp and uh, he's a very, very keen negotiator. And while negotiating this contract, they basically offered him an opportunity to buy in on this new settlement, to uh, to have an operation of his own that houses a secret temple to Medea. Medea's temples are all secret around the world. They are a shadowy society, his followers. The only one where they're, the only place where they have a public temple is in the city of trade, where every other deity has a temple to them. Um, and so they weren't prepared to deal with him. And so he was able to negotiate with them uh, into, yes, I will buy in on this. I will build this, this, uh, this, this temple for you. Uh, I will hide it to the best of my ability, but in order to do so, you have to promise me 10% of the tithes that come into this temple. So this wealth that basically was supposed to go to the worship, basically, of this god, uh, is being filtered to him as well. Uh, so they're, they're somewhat displeased with him. What they also didn't anticipate was just how small his fortune has become. His The majority of his money is spent paying out alimony, essentially, uh, paying... You know, supporting his uh, his family lineage, um, and so he didn't have the money to buy in on this operation. He lied to them about that, but he was sure he could get the money. So after these decades spent in embarrassment, he approached the major partners of the consortium, and they all laughed at him and wouldn't give him any money or any time of day basically spitting upon him. He knocked on every single door he possibly could until he found one investor who would who would even give him the time of day. And he when this when this investor 
when he spoke to him. The investor made him basically make uh, what I'm calling a beggar's bargain. It is the last resort of, of fools and gamblers. Uh, the only condition upon which he would loan money to Cade Kale was if Cade Kale put up his own life and the life of his entire family as collateral on the loan. Should things fail, should they go belly up, Cade Kale surrenders his life and the life of his entire lineage into slavery in Jolf. And being a slave in Jolf, you are no longer considered a man, you are considered an object. Um, and it is a, a horrible, brutal, scary life, and it would be the ultimate embarrassment uh, and, and the ultimate torture for Cade Kale uh, to know that he was a slave and to know that his family were, was sold into slavery. And so he took the beggar's bargain. And so at the beginning of this game that we played, he has already constructed the temple. It sits below uh, his, his textile mill, um, and he is making money, uh, a, small, a pittance at right now through the temple. But he is beginning to make money on his textile, uh, his textile mill. And he's reinvesting every bit of that into his business because he knows that if any, if that things are so tenuous in this in this this settlement that is basically ruled by these these uh, these bloodthirsty ogres uh, that he uh, cannot fail. And if he does fail, uh, if the settlement fails, he will lose everything. His family will lose everything. So this character has something at stake from the very beginning of the game. Before the GM has, has laid down any of their plot, any of the kind of external events that are going to happen and shape this world, my character had a goal. And I personally had an investment in this character because I didn't want to see him fail. Um, and that brings an enormous amount to the table. Um, it, first of all, brings you into uh, a, a situation where you are, you are invested in your character and you want to see them succeed, but it also gives you something right off the bat to be pursuing. Uh, it's not just that, oh, you know, we met in, we met in, a, in a tavern and now we're going to go on an adventure. It's that you are there in this circumstance for a reason. And you have a goal that you are trying to attain. Um, and if you fail, there you're going to the consequences are going to be terrible for uh, for you. Um, so, giving something at stake uh, really invested me in the success of this settlement. I wanted to see this this thing build up. It wasn't just I'm you know as a gamer having my own selfish motives. I want to get experience and I want to you know defeat the bad guy. It's that I want to make the story itself succeed. I built a character that would support the story, uh, would su that supported the very premise of the game. And this is what you want to do when you create a character. You don't want to make someone who is, uh, who doesn't have flaws, who doesn't have anything at stake, and who doesn't have any kind of a skeleton in their closet. Having a skeleton in your closet is, and I can say this from experience, since most of my experience is being a GM, I almost never am a player in these games. Uh, but giving the GM that kind of ammunition to use against you to present new obstacles uh, and to change those obstacles is uh, is going to make your game way better. I love it when my character, when my players bring me a character that has a dark past or has uh, you know has a background that I can I can use. Uh, in a sense, use against them in the game to, to make the game, to put more conflict into the game. So this is what you want to do as a player, is to create someone who has something at stake from the very beginning. And that, that those stakes can change, and they will change over the course of the game. That, that will happen, and that's a good thing. But you don't want the stakes to be thrown in front of you. You know, you're, you're like, oh, okay, the, the storyteller has thrown me some meat. And now I want to protect this thing. And now I'll play. It's that you want to go into it already defending something, already standing up for something, um, already with a goal in mind, because that is going to put that whatever meat gets thrown at you, you're going to be hungry for it already. Um, and uh, also, there's, there's ways in which I made the stakes much higher for this character in particular. Given that backstory, I took a disadvantage um, called 
honor bound, which is probably one of the strongest disadvantages you can take. And what honor bound does is that basically when you give your word on something, you keep it. So Cade Kale is not the kind of person where if the thing goes belly up, is going to try and run away and save his family. He is the kind of person that is a man who is to a fault. He is a man of his word. And so he, if, if things go belly up and the Kalfar from the, uh, the trading consortium and from the city of Jolf uh, come for him, he's going to surrender to them. And he will, uh, you know, when they come for his family, he's going to let them take him because that was his responsibility. That was what he put up as collateral on the loan. Um, and of course, in game, this makes things a lot more complicated too because you can't lie to people. Uh, at least you, you can't agree to do something with them. You can't give them your word and then back out on it. Uh, that will have consequences on its own, but you can't do that with this with this sort of thing. Uh, so Cade has an enormous amount at stake, and um, I didn't even really, uh, you know, I, I, I started with the, with the advantage of second generation and the disadvantage of honor bound. Those were the first two things that were written down on my character sheet, and it was really once I had come up with enough of this story uh, about Cade Kale, and I knew a little bit about him, I was able to go through my character sheet and decide, okay, he's definitely going to be focused in things like diplomacy and guile and insight. He's going to be, because he's an expert negotiator, uh, he's uh, very academically inclined, he's very well read, um, but he's not going to be a character that is uh, focused on combat. Um, and this is actually something I ran into when I was playing the game. As I started getting experience, I was like, what am I going to spend my experience on? Because there are a lot of combat-centric advantages and, and all of these these cool advantages that let you get an edge on people or like, you know, intimidate them and awe him, awe them. And that's not really what my character, you know, what what was going to happen with him. He He's not a combat-focused character. He's not someone who's just going to try and intimidate everyone around him. His presence is very intimidating simply because he... he he is a he has a he's very strong in his conviction and he is uh, he has just a, an incredibly sharp mind uh, but what I found within the within ring of fire uh, advantages there are these advantages that are based on luck and that was something I thought would be really cool for him is that being able to you know having these turns of fate uh, happen in his favor so you can reroll ones you can ignore ones things things like this uh, Following this this path of luck uh, through the advantages might be something that uh, would be um, something that spoke to his character and gave him uh, more powerful advantages as time went on. Um, so that is basically how I constructed him. But uh, to create a compelling character, you have to throw away the notion that you want to make someone who is uh, going to be awesome at everything. They can be awesome at things. But you have to give them uh, something either in their past or something that is a deep character flaw of them that is going to be an obstacle to that goal. Uh, you want to give them something at stake, something to fight for right off the bat. Uh, and you want to give your, your storyteller or your, your flame tender uh, enough material in your background, interesting things that have happened to this character, interesting potential for your storyteller to work with, uh, because that will make your game better. It makes, as a, as a flame tender, when people give me a character with uh, that's not just like, oh, this is a kind of a general background, but this is a very specific background, and this is, this is something I want to see play out in the game, when they give that to me, it makes my story better, because I have just a general idea of what I want to do with a story, but once I get these, these, these character concepts in, that starts to give me more material to work with within the framework, framework of my own game. Uh, so it will make your GM better. It will make this story better. If you come to the table with something at stake, if you come to the table with skeletons in your closet, if you come to the table with a character that as much as you want them to be uh, you know, fun and, and to conquer things, they have to be a flawed character. There has to be, they have to have character flaws. Uh, that's the kind of character you want to play. I mean, think about the show Breaking Bad. If Walter White had not been such a proud son of a bitch, if he had not been so proud, that story would have been boring and it would have been over very quickly. Uh, because instead of deciding to cook meth, if he was just this, you know, this this person who was able to to you know 
swallow his pride and, and take the money from his rich friends to pay for his cancer treatments, he never would have been cooking meth. And that was the cool part of the show was him cooking meth and getting in deeper and deeper and getting over his head and, and having, you know, not being good at being a criminal from the very beginning. He was, he was, he was totally out of his league, but over time he became a criminal, a hardened criminal mastermind that nobody could beat. And a lot of that was because he was a deeply flawed person that he had this pride that he could never let go of, that he always, always had to be, get recognition and credit for what he was doing, even if it was in secret. I mean, look at the point at which, uh, in Breaking Bad, when, when Hank uh, thinks, when, when Gail gets killed, he thinks that he's found his Heisenberg. You know, Walt is drunk at dinner, and he's like, you know what? I think this guy was, was uh, you know, was an assistant or something. He's not your Heisenberg. Heisenberg might still be out there, and he's, he's drinking. And of course, this makes the other character in the story, this makes Hank go, yeah, you're right. I should still, I should continue trying to find this guy, which ruins everything. <laughs> it ruins everything, and it makes the story more interesting. Having these characters that are flawed and that make the wrong choice every once in a while is what makes for a better story. So don't make, you know, Sir Galahad the White. You know, make fucking Lancelot, who, you know, bangs Arthur's wife, or make Arthur, you know, who bangs his sister, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, you know. These, these, you have to have these characters that have weaknesses in their character, and and that is what will make an interesting story, uh, and that will bring out the best in the other players, and that'll bring out the best in your GM, and that'll make for a good game. Uh, so that's basically all I have to say on how to make a compelling character. Um, I generally make characters this way, in which I start with a character concept, and then I'll make a character based off, you know, go and fill out my sheet. So don't create a sheet first. Don't start, I have reverse engineered characters based off of, a, off of doing mechanical stuff first, and they're fun, and they're interesting, and you can still play a good game with that. I'm not gonna deny that, I've definitely done it, but my favorite characters are the ones in which I focus on building them, building the person and their backstory, and finding something at stake from the beginning, those are the best characters, the most memorable, and they're the characters that that other people that I've played with, that they're the ones that they remember. And that's how you win in an RPG. That's how you win, is by having the best story, having the most conflict, getting the most involved in your character and 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 not being afraid to, you know, raise your voice and 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 and, and get into character while you're playing. And you're not going to want, you, if you have well, these characters that you reverse engineer off of your statistics, you make a character and then you look out and you go, okay, what kind of a you know person has you know, a three in academics and a five in melee? And, and coming up with a backstory based on that, that is, you can have fun doing that, but you're not going to create those incredible memories playing RPGs when you do that. Uh, the best way to do it, in my experience, is to create a compelling, flawed character uh, that has a, that has goals at the outset, and those goals can and will change. That is, that's great. You know, don't be afraid of that. Don't stick on your initial goals. But when you're, uh, but going into the game with a goal before the flame tender has said a word to you will get you invested more in playing in an immersive style from the get go. Uh, so that is it. Uh, go play some role-playing games. <laughs>